Good morning. Now for some something completely different. We're going from the cells up to large scale stuff. And um, there's actually a, a pair of presentations, and I'm going to do the first part. And Matt Smith, who's one of the doctoral students in natural resources, is going to handle the second part. Um, so we're looking first at, um, well, why don't we get into shift my arrows here? Must be that one. Yes, okay. Um, so I'm conferencing with New England dairy folks in the recent past. Among the things they were concerned about were reducing costs, and obviously there's a whole range of those things that you have to spend, mo have to spend money on, feed, energy, bedding, and, and things like that. And so this project carves out the bedding part and the energy part to bring some uh, experimental knowledge to figuring out how we might be able to do this a little bit better. And so, in a nutshell, the project is this one slide, and I'm going to cover in the next few minutes the, the woodlands wood shaving part. I'm going to get it from the stump to the shed, which is the title of my little part, and then Matt's going to take over and turn the shavings over to the dairy herd, let them use it, and then cycle back through on what to do with the compost how to recover energy, and then get it back onto the farm fields to sort of close the loop. If we were really closing the loop, we'd take the compost and put it back in the woods, but uh, that's a, a little hard to do. So, um, what we wanted to do first was get some idea of what we were spending at the university. We have dairy operations, including the organic dairy farm, and we buy lots of uh, Eastern white pine uh, wood shavings, that's the EWP, we buy it by the, the van load. It's available, it's a very good uh, material for bedding, and um, at one time it used to be very, relatively inexpensive. If you go back far enough, sawmills used to give away their sawdust, right? Well, those days are gone, right? You have to buy it now and shavings are along, and we also have this new biomass industry out there that's beginning to suck up some of the lower grade material. So you're competing for it when you're out buying, and that's what the university has found in their own operations. So it looked like we were spending somewhere between, we'll do the math here quickly, 18 to $21 um, a cubic yard, or about two grand for 100 cubic yards, and it would have to be trucked in from a long way, so a big part of that cost is the transportation. Let's see, well, maybe if we produced it locally, we'd eliminate that transportation cost, plus other margins that might be built into other productions. And the, the math showed on our own accounting system is that we're spending seventy-five to eighty-five thousand dollars a year for animal bank. That's a, that's a lot of money. The question is, can we do it ourselves cheaper than buying it off farm? And if we can do it, maybe the farmers in the wing, dairy farmers in the wing, could do it as well. So, what are the systems that have to be in place? And what do they cost to operate? And does that set up a, the circumstances that makes it economically feasible for a private operation to actually do this versus? An experimental operation where we can we can afford to make mistakes because we're supposed to make mistakes. That's what experiments are about. Dairy farmers can't. So research makes the mistakes for the farmers, and that sorts out whether the system will or will not work. So we'll walk you through a few of the things that we've thought about and a little bit of our initial preliminary data to get a sense of where we're heading. Um, we're operating mostly on the organic dairy farm almost exclusively on the organic dairy farm and the associated woodlands um, located in Lee, New Hampshire. Uh, many of you probably have visited that farm and know where it is and how it operates. Uh, there's a woodlot associated with that uh, farm and we acquired a wood shaving machine and you can see that it's not an inexpensive piece of equipment, $60,000, and it's the, um, the bluish item here in the middle. <coughs> We're using only softwoods, we're using mostly pine and hemlock, and the dimensions are somewhere between four and eight feet long. They can be two to 24 inches in diameter. We don't want to get them too small, and we don't want to get them too large. 
get too large, they won't fit into the shaving machine. So there's a lot of things that go into um, figuring out what we should be measuring. And so we, here's a list of this. There's 25 things in all. I probably if you looked at it more closely than me, it'd be even more. So we need to know how well the machine operates. We need to know about all the other uh, equipments that has to be brought in. We have to compare it to what we're spending, because if it turns out to be cheaper to go buy somebody else's bedding, that's that's a good answer. Uh, we have to take care of the, um, the purchase of the shaving machine, uh, what the interest rates might be, if we have to borrow the money to do that, how many years we're going to take to pay off that loan, how many years the machine is going to last, and what's it worth at the end? Is it just scrap metal, or is it actually something that we might be able to sell off and, and roll over just as you might any other of your farm equipment. Uh, how much power do we take uh, uh, is required um, for the drying process and things like that. And then when we get done with all that, uh, the variable things that go into it, we'll have some idea of how many hours we can operate the machine, how long it takes to load, um, how many tons or cords of wood we can use, what we're spending on labor, what we're spending on fuel, maintenance, um, we discovered, among other things, that the machine, well, we weren't surprised, the machine does break down and it does take time to um, get it going. And we found out it was easy to jam the machines if you didn't load the locks carefully, among other things. But anyway, uh, we'll go, I'll go quickly through the steps here. Um, chainsaw and skitter to uh, fell the wood in the um, University of Woodlands, which are right next to the farm. So it was a fairly easy job to do the harvesting operation and then transport the wood to the staging area next to the wood shaving machine. Uh, for our initial experiment, we harvested approximately 50 cores of eastern white pine and 10 cores of hemlock. Um, the cost was about $78 per core to get them, get that stuff to the landing. Now that's a little high, but part of that cost has to do with some uh, road repair that we had to do, and so that cost is being charged off against that first few loads of pine as we go further and bring more wood. The road costs will be amortized across more volume and that number should go down. Um, our preliminary calculations suggest that if we were picking off the land from the wood from about two, a little over two acres, we probably can sustain this. And you can see that, that we've, we've cleared it out pretty well. We've got fairly expensive stands of um, fairly low quality white pine, so we feel pretty good about it. And one of the things we did do when we did get an occasional good log, maybe I can back up. This one here looks like it has a little promise to it. Um, if we had a saw log, a couple of truckloads worth, we were able to trade that. So we're not shaving the number one saw logs. We're sending them off to the sawmill. We're hanging on to the number three saw logs because there's not much difference between a number three saw log and a piece of pulp wood. So we trade the good stuff for the not so good stuff. And uh, the ratio, I think, uh, was about, in terms of volume, about 1.25 to 1. So we've got more pulp wood than we got um, saw logs. And we recognized that um, we had to share the cost of trucking that in because somebody else did the harvesting of the pulp wood elsewhere. And to bring it to us. And that's one of the other things, even sharing the cost, you're still paying for delivered wood. And that's one of the things that brings that $7, $8 number up higher probably than it should be. But we did gain, gain some biomass as a result. So if in normal operations, a dairy farm could sell off those saw logs and recover from somebody else, um, that might be possible. There's always plenty of low grade wood that people would much rather haul a shorter distance to somebody's farm than a four hour round trip to Jay, Maine or something, um, given the cost of diesel and everything else. So, um, shaving the wood from wood pile, which we don't have, well, back here we have a wood pile pot. Okay, we have the wood pile from the wood pile, uh, small piece of equipment, we'll grapple onto. Uh, three or four logs and bring them over to a, um, is this the little arrow? Yep, there it is. We built a little deck here, which allowed us to shave off the bark. 
um, the shavings grow much better without the bark. And we also found that by letting the logs sit for a while, the bark sloughs off a lot easier. So we clean off a good piece of the bark and then um, the, then it's lifted up and loaded into the hopper, which is the red piece right here. And then that hopper moves back and forth against the shaving head that's underneath. And the chips, uh, the shavings come out the other end. Matt, did you bring up the bag? Okay. Visual aid will be coming around. Um, I'd say you can open your hand up, and put it, open it up, put your hand in there, but we might litter all over here. So whatever you'd like to do. So. Um, what we figured out in going through this process, and we're relatively rookies at this, and Matt and a couple of um, work study students did the actual labor here, and I think they still consider themselves rookies at it. So we didn't put through a whole lot of um, material to get started. Among other things, there was a, a warranty break. We, we didn't have a breakdown, but there was a warranty repair that needed to be done by the manufacturer, so we shut down for that. Plus, we're competing for use with some of the uh, equipment, like this uh, loader here, with the farm. And so we didn't put through as much wood as we expected. But we seem to be operating at about 12 cubic yards to the hour. So when we're actually up, running and moving along, the, the, the shavings are coming off that shaver pretty well. And um, in working through the cost of what we had so far, uh, to produce the green shaving, so just what it takes to get through the shaver into the, the wagon, the van that we have, we figure it's about six dollars a cubic yard without without counting the machine costs that we paid for for the wood shaver and the amortization and all of the, the things that we have to do to deal with the capital costs of that equipment. So that's obviously going to add to the six dollars, but just a, a quick run through the, the labor, the wood, the fuel for the machine, about $6 a cubic yard. So once we get the rest of that figured out, we'll have a, a pretty good idea. That, you know, somewhere above 6 but we think below 18 will be the, the final answer that you can actually do this on farm for less than the purchase price of wood shavings. And we hope to get a detailed cost analysis uh, done a little bit later. So um, we're, we're building this, I guess, a spreadsheet on steroids is the best way to describe it. It's fairly complicated, which would look at the situation of whether a dairy operation could afford to buy a wood shaving machine and actually do their own production. Um, of course, one of the other issues has to be you have to have a forest attached to the farm or you have to have some kind of wood supply so somebody's got to bring the wood to the wood shaving machine. Um, we were able to go a little over a couple acres and you know, it says one acre but I guess it was closer to two. But we harvested one acre? Yep. We harvested one but we could we could harvest two. Yeah, we could yeah. harvest two. And uh, so we're also as part of that thing uh, uh, that experiment we need to measure in fairly excruciating detail how much volume we actually got out of here. You know, the quick scaling thing the foresters might do, and I'm a forester, so I know how that's done. That just gives you a really rough idea, but if we want to have good production numbers of how many cubic yards of shavings we're getting out the other end, we have to have a, a much more detailed analysis of how much wood are in these stems as we shave them up. So we have to do a bit more experimentation, verify that things work, and then we'll turn, turn loose on the public and see what they think. Um, we're also interested in looking at the eastern white pine versus the eastern hemlock. Uh, we've got lots of pine, but we also have a lot of hemlock, and a lot of that's in jeopardy right now with the um, hemlock lily of Delgin. And so it's a good question, well, now what do you do with that stuff? Do you let it die, or do we now have a, a reasonably economic low uh, use for that low grade material come on this essentially low grade and can we go out and capture that and still make good shavings for the dairy herd and right now uh, other things they're working on is various methods to dry the bedding um, getting a kiln is a fairly expensive thing and then we also have to be thinking about you know, how do we 
think about the future stands, because if you don't have a, a big, massive woodlot, the university's got 2,000 acres all together nearby that farm, other people won't have that access. Well, what size forest do they need? What's the composition of the forest that you need in order to do this on a sustainable basis? So those are questions that remain to be answered. Um, our timber harvesting was done by our woodlands manager, Steve Eisenhower, and some other folks who have been participating, um, university employees at the organic dairy farm, and other folks that either are either students or employees of the College of Life Sciences, and we thank them. And we have questions. We don't have questions. Well, we probably should do. If you have one question, I can answer one question, and I think turn it over to Matt, Matt and then let Matt fill in the rest Matt. of the story now that we've got the chips. What do we do with the okay. chips? So, so I'm, Matt may have to answer it anyway, Ted, but what is the dry matter of the shavings as they come off a log that's sat for six months? Or you know, assuming so you don't shave them fresh, I, I know they've somewhat sat there for a while. Yeah, so the six month logs came out at 30%, and then we tried drying them with a solar dryer and it got them down to 20. But oddly enough, the whole outer shell that was just out in the sun for six hours got down to 9% moisture content. So, we're thinking we just stir the pile around. That would be the most effective, low-cost method. But we're hoping to get a group of engineering students to really try out different drying methods that are low-cost. And so that's going to be this upcoming summer. So what is the target? Like, if you were purchasing shavings that you would age by the tractor, so what, what? Kiln dried is the best. And so we purchase it at like nine to ten percent, but the regional equally is at twelve percent. So really, like, we're shooting for twelve percent is what we're currently using at the organic dairy right now. So this is the second half of my dissertation work, is pretty much what happens to the bedding after we shave it. Um, and so Ted got us through the first two steps of the process of actually cutting down the trees and then processing um, the logs and shavings. And so after that, the shavings go into UNH's bed pack system. And as of now, we're purchasing 700 cubic yards a year for that particular farm. Um, and we're processing another 3,000 for the other farm systems, the equine facility and the Fairchild Dairy. Um, and so I'll go through each one of these steps right here. And so some background on the heat recovery composting facilities. It was donated by a private donor with supplemental funding from uh, New Hampshire AES. And the primary goal of this heat recovery compost facility is to produce heat, find the best way to extract the heat from the compost, and also find the best way to use the heat. Um, and so as of right now, the heat on the farm is being used to um, hot, to warm water. It's pretty much a pre-boiler that goes into the milk house, and there's a supplemental boiler in there as well that bumps the water up another 70 degrees. But if we're pretty much saving costs on warming water. And the cool thing is this is the only, the fourth facility in the world using this technology. Two of them right now are in Vermont, and there's another one in New York, and there's people thinking of building one in Boston. Um, and so there's not too many, so we're kind of breaking the ground here, testing technology. There's a few little kinks that we're working out. And a system that actually develops this technology is in Vermont, it's called AgriLab Technologies. And the cool thing is this technology actually developed out of the aerospace industry, and someone came up with this idea of, hey, we could use it for composting. And I'll describe how the technology works in upcoming slides. And so the UNH facility is called an aerated static pile composting facility. So I say there's only four of these in the world, but truthfully, there's, there's many more. They're just not using the heat recovery unit. And so the way an aerated static pile system works is you pretty much load the compost into the facility, and then you don't turn it after that unlike a lot of other composting operations where you're turning it to aerate it. In this situation, you're actually using a fan system to supply the microbes with the oxygen. So everything is kept aerobic, and that's crucial because if things go anaerobic, it doesn't produce as much heat. And so since we're trying to recover heat, we constantly have to supply oxygen to the microbes. And pretty much a larger microbial population means more heat, and so this whole product has almost turned into a microbiome type study in terms of how can we feed the microbes, how can we keep them happy, how can we prevent ourselves from killing them, which happens at 160 degrees or higher, which we've done a few times. Um, and so really it is providing a favorable microbial environment. 
Okay, so this slide right here really provides info on how the big picture works. Um, so we load compost into the building, and I'm going to describe each one of these steps in great detail, but this is the, the basic flow diagram. So we load compost into our full barn and cast in the concrete our aeration lines. It's just standard PVC pipe with holes drilled in it, and it's connected to a giant fan system. And so we suck air down through the compost into this aeration system, and all that heated compost vapor, and right now it's about 130 degrees because it's winter time, but typically we can get up to the 150s. All that hot air blows into this giant heat exchange unit right here. Um, and within this heat exchange unit are these stainless steel rods with a working refrigerant inside. So when you blow hot compost vapor on one end of it, it warms the rods up along their whole length, and half the rods are actually contained in a 300 gallon tank of water. And so when you're blasting that hot contaminated compost air on this half, you're warming up this clean water on this side. And this clean water for UNH right now is about 110 degrees. Um, it's been dropping recently because it's been so cold and we have some old compost batches in there. But ultimately this 110 degree water goes over to the milk house where we bump up the temperature another 60 degrees and then that serves all the farm's hot water needs. So the basic idea is instead of using warming up 50 degree well water on this end, we're only having to warm it up a, like 60 degrees more close to 100 degrees. And so with all that's the cost savings right there. Um, and so before we load a compost bay, and so this is the inside of our facility, um, we have to unload a batch of material, and it takes about an hour to two hours to unload a composting bay. And each composting bay is about 100 tons of material. And you can see the aeration lines cast into the concrete. They're four feet up, uh, apart. Um, and then we also have to have cover plates over the aeration lines before we load. And then we also have to put wood chips on top because you don't want to suck compost fines down into the system because it breaks the fans. And so you have to be very careful about this particular spot because if you don't do it correctly, the whole pile will go anaerobic. And actually the first composting bay, this one right here that we loaded, that happened because we didn't have the loading method down um, the way we do it now. Pretty much we loaded the whole facility with wood chips across, but when we were backing up with our manure spreader to load, the manure spreader wheels were actually pushing the wood chips aside, and manure was dropping down into the aeration holes. And so we had an entire bay that was loaded, and if you've seen hard manure, it's like cement, and so no air was getting to it. And so now we load the facility in blocks, um, eight feet at a time, pile it up higher, and it's working beautifully, and we're getting amazing compost temperatures. And so when we load a monthly batch, um, it's about 215 cubic yards or 100 tons, like wet tons, per bay. Um, and so we load two bays per batch. And so one side of the bay serves as control, and then the other side of the bay serves as a treatment. Um, and so right now we've loaded six batches. The first four batches are really like trial and error, like what's the best compost recipe? What's the best way to load it? And now, um, batch five and six, we're starting to do the replicated trial, which is really exciting. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, it's about 12 hours of labor to unload and load a batch. And this time is continually dropping. Um, it was at like 15 to 18 hours before because we have feedstocks all over the place. But now all of our feedstocks are in one location. So when we're mixing it, we're not driving around as much. And so we're, we're streamlining this whole process right here. And so heat production, the heat is uh, produced from the microbes. As I said, we have compost that's done aerobically. Um, there's heat production just from the metabolic activity. And an important point is that the aeration to remove um, the heat is much more than the aeration that's required for the microbes. And so if you're not pulling enough heat from the system, the microbes can actually die because they'll get too hot. And actually this happened for Christmas time, we were getting temperatures up in the 170s because we were following the standard recommendations for heat removal, but we, we developed a really hot batch. And so we had to turn on the aeration system. And of course, that's before I had to go on vacation. So my parents were at the compost facility over Christmas, watching pile temperatures and making sure things didn't go too crazy. Because um, you don't want the biological oxidation to go to chemical. Because when that happens, you can get spontaneous combustion. And although it's 
quite rare. You don't want to be the person that burns down the compost facility. <laughs> um, and so uh, another thing just in the compost vapor, since we are doing aerobic composting, there's minimal to no methane. There are little pockets of it, but we are producing a lot of ammonia. And if we're doing things right, our ammonia production will be massive because uh, that's what you get when you have high heat compost. But the cool thing is the ammonia can be scrubbed out very easily with a biofilter. And uh, we're going to be installing one of those next year. And so here's a picture of before the Christmas of the temperatures getting up into the 170s. And they are going well beyond that. Um, and so the goal is to reach 160 for pathogen kill. But truthfully, you don't want to get that hot. You want to maintain it in the 130 to 150 range. Ideally, like 140, and extend that period for the longer period of time. When you start going up into the 160s and beyond, you can get a boom and bust cycle. And sometimes, when you go bust, it doesn't go back up. And so, uh, we're really refining this just to try and keep it in that 140 to 150 range for a longer period of time. Because um, then we'll get more heat recovery over a longer period. Because right now, the farm doesn't have enough biomass to pull off loading two bays every single month. If this were a true composting facility and we had lots of biomass, we would only keep that material in there for four weeks, opposed to 120 days. And then I would want those high temperatures for that four week period. Um, and then I just cure the compost outside. But because uh, we have to keep it in there longer, if you go up into the 160s, 170s, then you're gonna end up with a cold pile that's sitting in there not helping you um, during the winter time. And here are just some preliminary data. Um, this is a typical curve we're getting at the facility now, where it takes about a week to get up into the 160s. Um, true composting operations will oftentimes be able to get up into three days, but since we're doing heat recovery that's dependent on the water molecules and pulling the energy out of there, we load more wet batches than you typically would load. Um, and that's a recommendation from the company because you get better heat recovery initially from it. And so it takes a little bit longer to get up there. Um, but as you can see, we're maintaining pretty high temperatures. And these temperature curves right here, um, we take them once a week. We take 64 measurements per pile. So we take it at one foot below the surface, three feet, and then five feet below. So we're measuring up the wazoo in the piles. And then we have temperature probes and the aeration lines themselves and the concrete. So we're tracking all the heat recovery from this entire system. And so here's a picture. I mean, I might actually, can you turn the light down? So we, it's hard, kind of hard to see. But here's our heat recovery unit right here. And you can kind of see this part right here. It's just a giant 24-foot culvert pipe. And that inside that pipe is isobars. And the isobars actually run through the pipe and into this bulk storage tank of water. You can actually see the pipe right there, the isobars coming through. And so when you blast compost vapor on that end, it warms up this end right here. And like I said, we are getting up to 110 degrees when we refine the system we're expecting to get into the 130s um, and maintain it at 130. Um, and it's the first facility utilizing this technology. Um, and so it's about 10,000 a year in energy savings that the first facility has seen. We haven't calculated how much we're saving because, as I said, we just started this past summer. And so uh, our cost savings haven't been calculated yet, but we're expecting it to be around 5,000. But um, we'll have that number probably in a year's time. And the payback for the system, the first few facilities that have done this have seen a four to eight year payback. Um, but our facility costs a lot more because we built a research facility. I'll get into that in a second. But um, with regard to payback period, a lot of people always ask, like, oh, what's the payback, what's the payback of this? But the, the truth is, with these kind of facilities, there's so many variables involved that it's hard just to spit out a payback for you. And so what we're doing instead is providing everyone with all of our cost information in specific detail so people can develop their own payback period. Because we already had tractors, we had a mixer, um, we had all those things. But if a farm were starting from scratch and needed a payloader or a screener, the payback period would be much higher than that. And so some of the accomplishments so far is um, help design the facility. And so this facility truly is designed for research with uh, split replicates. And so there's more cost 
in the design process because of that. Um, and like I said, we're doing this massive cooperative extension report on how this facility was built, cost structure down to like the box of nails, for instance. It's that detailed. And so people could replicate this facility, but make it even better. And we discussed how to make it better than the one we have and how to do it more cheaply. Uh, we've also developed standard recipe on the first four batches. Um, and just for reference, to produce the hottest mix, we found that it's the 31 CN ratio, 65% moisture content. And the bulk density, like the pellets per cubic yard, is the most important. You want a really nice fluffy mix to pull the air through the compost. The most recent batch we loaded two weeks ago, it was a winter batch. It was at 1,600. And that's because we had that thaw and all the material we loaded in there was chucked full of water. And so that is a frozen block right now. So winter composting, our current system has been a very big challenge. And so we're trying to figure that out. But, you know, the spring, summer, and fall composting has worked beautifully. And some of the research objectives to complete is we need to determine the optimal aeration intensity, like how much heat can be pulled from the system without crashing it. And so we're going to be taking that risk right there. We also want to see if we can do high nitrogen charges um, to see if we can get more heat. Um, we have a giant leachate tank and this whole system produces about 1500 gallons of this syrupy brown liquid a week from the aeration system, from the condensation and also from the compost leaching in general. Question is, can we put that back in there and does it justify the cost and the time of doing so with regard to heat production in the end? Um, we also want to test various compost covers to see if we can actually pull more heat from the system. We have two of these on there right now, and uh, we'll have results in probably two months' time. We'll post on the website um, to see whether or not it's economical to put compost covers on for heat recovery. The covers were 300 bucks each, and so it'll be interesting to see if we can how long it'll take to pull that money back. Um, and then I also want to compare various mixing options. Right now we're mixing with a manure spreader, and it's working beautifully. But if we used another type of mixer, would the mix be better, and would it produce more heat? And so we're going to test that out. And so the capital cost of the facility, it cost 538000 to build our compost facility, and 37000 that was a heat exchanger. This also included a mixing pad. And so if a non-institutional organization were to do this, um, it'd probably be a little less, about half as much, but that's going with a clear span structure, that's going with concrete waste blocks, and all those details are in that large report we're going to be publishing in the next few months on how to do this much more cheaply, um, and it has all the cost structure. And just for um, fun, we also put the operating cost. It costs us about $3 to produce every cubic yard of compost. And that cost is constantly going down. And that's just the electricity cost right there for running the fans um, and all the and running the circulation pump and all that. But it is about three dollars to produce a cubic yard of compost for us right now. Um, and just like to thank the work study students and the farm staff for helping out. It's a, a big project and all the help we have has made it much better. Questions? So what Matt's talked about is uh, another um, aspect of having an agricultural experiment station. We, we, the university, the agricultural experiment station, can explore new ideas, take the risk that we wouldn't want individual farmers to take, but looking at new technologies, new approaches, and uh, in this case, our hope is to decrease uh, Long-term hope is to drive down the cost of inputs and figure out optimal ways to do this. And that's why Matt is going to work very heavily with extension in getting the when he has the optimal formulas out there, getting that information to everyone. Yeah, so, so Matt, um, one of the new types of dairy barns that have been designed just recently is called the compost bed pack. Oh, yes, yeah. And compost bed packs, you basically put down bedding and you till it twice a day, turn it over. The goal for the compost bed pack is that the temperature should get up to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Yep. And which is what you're doing here. 
So just thinking outside of the box, that compost, farmers aren't going to like this, could actually probably be put back under the cows. It could, after it was done. Um, people were asking about compost or beta packs earlier, and that it would be good for this system if you were using the material after the fact because you probably couldn't go back and use weed. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah, you've lost all your heat. But theoretically, you could use this, the compost material instead of shavings. But then there's there's a whole group of people that think it's fantastic, and there's another group that's like, oh, you're putting this high nitrogen or high potentially microbial count material there, but it comes down to can you heat it enough? Because if you don't heat the compost enough, then it's going to be disaster. Dr. Brito and I were on a compost pit pack farm just left uh, this past fall, and it was the cleanest. They're really interesting. Barn. Yeah. Cows were immaculate. Yeah. Could you add some uh, microbial studies to sort out, uh, to test the pile in different places at the end to see what classes of bacteria are left? Yeah, you certainly could. And actually, if it wasn't an organic farm, there's uh, some companies in the site, because my first research, when I was a master's, I'm saying lots of ethanol, and they've developed some microbes that go after cellulose like crazy, like some genetically modified ones, but obviously you can't bring that onto an organic farm, but there's interesting potential research for composters bringing in that type of organism inside of a composting system, especially if you're doing heat recovery, because you can go beyond the thermophilic stage, but there is a lot of microbial research that could be done on these systems. Another question? Yeah, so, so with the the air, what do you call it, the, where the air is flowing through, yep. um, you put dry shavings there to prevent you know, wet materials from getting or smaller materials, fines, you call them, yep. getting sucked in. What, what other options might you have there? I mean, could straw be an option? Could finer screens? You know, that seems like that was a bit of a challenge. Do you think that would be a, yeah. it to be a challenge for operators? That's, and that's a standard in the industry now. It's, and it's actually bowl wood chips. It's they're, they're big chips that oh, you okay. put down. Because I was um, I'm, I'm picturing almost like the shavings we just looked at. Oh, yeah, no, they're, they're big okay. chunks of materials. Okay. Actually, some places use screens, but it's more expensive. And if it warps, you can hit it with the payloader. So people have found the cheapest is just to use the big chips. So they're big, heavy chips, and they're not. They don't have and it's about a cubic yard per aeration line, so every day you saw it takes four yards that material. So where do you get that? We just buy it from along the trucking industry. 